Father, we come to you this morning. We just thank you, Lord, for the many things that you do. We just ask your blessings on this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he did for us on Calvary. Father, we just thank you for the many things we just take for granted. That, you know, the beautiful things that you give us, like the singing songbirds and the, the just all the joyful the humpback whales with the songs they sing for us, all the many things that we just take for granted, Lord, the, the great creation that you've, you've created for us. Father, we just ask your blessings on the service. Be with your servant. Just have people's hearts and minds be open to hear the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to be preaching on worshiping God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, singing hymns, psalms, or spiritual songs is as much a part of the church service as the sermon, though it should not surpass it or just about replace sermons as has happened in many churches. You know, many times churches nowadays will have all these fifth singing, uh, song and singing, and, or they'll have all these groups coming all the time, but it's just they want to spend more time with having services canceled for music than actually preaching itself. You know, I'm not saying there isn't maybe a time or place for some of that, but uh, again, worshiping songs is it, important, but it should not take the place of a sermon. Now, God commands us to sing to Him. Singing brings you closer to His Word. Singing godly hymns keeps your mind on the Lord and away from sinful thoughts and also strengthens you in times of despair as it did Paul and Silas while they were in jail. The righteous singing glorifies God. Psalms and hymns can teach you the word of God. Look at a couple verses here. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now many churches have done away with some singing or worse and have replaced what God commands us to sing with contemporary music, the so-called praise songs. Now some of those are okay, but most are not. You know, they'll replace it with also the, besides the praise songs, they'll replace it with so-called Christian rock, the Christian rap, and other types of ungodly types of music. You know, so you, either they go to one stream or the other, they either get rid of the music altogether, which God again commands us to have music as part of the service, which as much a part as the sermon, as I said, just not to replace it. Or they go to the other extreme where they have all this ungodly music, you know, they'll have Christian rock and so forth, where they just rock and roll, where they throw in the name Jesus, and then they say, oh, well, it's got the name Jesus in it, it's Christian music. No, God says otherwise. And many churches with this type of music use drums and electric guitars, just like in rock and roll, and have loud music, just like in rock and roll. And again, this is not pleased, God is not pleased with this type of music to worship Him, and seems to have warned us of it. Okay, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You know, and that's exactly what this type of music is. Just like the contemporary, I mean, uh, secular type rock and roll and rap and all that stuff, the same thing. There's no difference because you throw the name Christian in front of it. It's still ungodly, satanic music. And God does not approve of it. You know, many of these songs, like especially your praise songs and stuff, just repeat choruses over and over and over, just like a repetitive prayer which God condemns. You know, many believe just because a song mentions the name Jesus, it is suitable for worship. They are not. A Christian rock, a Christian rap, or anything but Christian. 
A Christian should not be listening to these outside of church, let alone inside of church service. Now I know professing Christians who listen to secular rock music who have even said that rock music has no place in church. And they are right. They also shouldn't be listening to it outside either, but at least they recognize it doesn't belong in church. Now Christian rock music is just as much from Satan as secular rock music. The beat is the same in both. Now this beat is used in Africa by primitive tribes to call up their false gods, which are nothing more than devils. Now missionaries have seen this when their children started playing rock music, and the natives got agitated since this is the same beat they used for their worship of their false gods. Now Christian rock singers often have the same appearance and habits of secular satanic rock singers. You know, a lot of your rock and roll singers, some secular ones, they'll admit that they were possessed at the time, or they admit they worship Satan and so forth, but yet these so-called Christian rock singers have all the same habits and looks and so forth. They both often have long hair, which God condemns on a man, have tattoos, piercings, drink alcohol, cuss, and often smoke and do drugs. And they also will do like the devil's horns and do all the same satanic symbols that uh, the, the secular rock and roll singers will do. They all know oftentimes have no problem hanging out with them. These are all things God condemns, so why would he approve of this music to worship him? Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. Now the printing of marks here refers to tattoos. Now again, too many Christians are going around getting, getting tattoos. You know, they're like, oh, well it says I love Jesus or something like that. It doesn't matter. Tattoos are wrong no matter what they say. I don't care if it's the name of your child that died or anything else. God condemns tattoos and he warns us against them. Scripture speaks of many great men and women of God glorifying and worshiping God in song and music. It is always done with righteousness. Paul and Silas sang praises to God at midnight while prisoners locked in a Philippian jail. Acts chapter 16 verse 25 says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now Jesus himself sang hymns to worship his Father. Jesus and the apostles sang a hymn after they had the Last Supper before the death of Jesus on the cross. We see this in Matthew chapter 26 verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And then in Mark chapter 14 verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out in the Mount of Olives. Now the psalmist in Psalm 104 verse 33 says, He will sing unto the Lord as long as he lives, and so should we. Now Psalm 144 verse 33, this is what it says, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Now Moses and the Israelites sang the song to the Lord after crossing the Red Sea. This is the first song mentioned in Scripture. Exodus 15, 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now Miriam led the women in singing to the Lord after the crossing of the Red Sea. We see that in Exodus chapter 15 verse 21. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now singing hymns to God can build up and comfort others, such as when David played the harp before Saul to refresh him, 
and drove away the evil spirit by his plane. We see that in 1 Samuel 16, 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a heart and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now James chapter 5, verse 13 says, To sing psalms if we are happy. This is what Psalm, James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Singing psalms allows you to learn scripture as well as bring a joyous noise to the Lord. You know, the Hebrew, the, the Israelites, they sing the psalms all the time. And God said to sing unto him. Psalm 105 verse 2 says, Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Now we are to sing psalms to him. See this in 1 Chronicles 16, 9. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. You notice, these are basically identical verses here. The Israelites often sang psalms to the Lord. Psalms 113 to 118 are sung as part of the Feast of Tabernacles. There are seven psalms that say to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And God commands us to sing unto Him, even if we or someone else thinks we are not good singers. Now, all sounds to good, good to God, if it is godly, pleasing music and done with a righteous heart. So sing out and sing joyously to the Lord. Even if you think you're not a good singer, don't worry about what else somebody else says. Just sing out unto the Lord. It sounds good to Him, and it's an obedience to God. And sing loud for the Lord. Look at Psalm 66.1. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. And then Psalm 81.8. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. And then Psalm 95, 1 and 2. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. And then Psalm 98, 4. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. In Psalm 98, 6, with trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. And then Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Now we are a triune beings, just as God, since man was made originally in God's image. We all have a body, soul, and spirit. Spirit is what worships God. God said we are to sing to Him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. You know, the Spirit is what we use to worship God. That's the part of us that, that worships God. And many verses tell us to sing praises to God. Now here's just a few. Psalm 147.1 Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12 says, Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now God said to sing a new song to him. Now this should encourage and inspire those that God has given the gift of music to, to write new hymns and spiritual songs to Him. You know, just because something's brand new, a new hymn or, or song, you know, doesn't mean it, it's ungodly. It doesn't mean we always have to have you know, one from 200 years ago. It's just that most of this new contemporary music, again, it, it's not the type of music that God wants. So it's not saying that because something's brand new, it's ungodly. It's the type of music that it is. So, you know, for anyone out there that knows how to, has been, you know, been given a gift by God to write type of music, you know, write some godly hymns and spiritual music and so songs. Psalm 98.1 says, 
Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Psalm 149.1 says, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. And Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2 says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. So again, God wants us to create new songs and hymns for him. It just has to be the right godly type, not the satanic stuff that most churches are going to. You know, notice that Psalm, the book of Psalms has many references to songs because the book of Psalms, that's the whole point of it, was it's a singing, you know, where God says, tell us, I read those two verses in Galatians and in Colossians, that, uh, you know, we are, sorry, Ephesians and Colossians, that we are to sing psalms is one of the things we are to sing, along with songs, uh, spiritual songs and, and hymns. But the whole book of Psalms was meant for the Israelites. It's, that was like their hymnal. It's just like we have a hymnal today. You know, that would have been the Israelites' hymnal, the whole book. So there's many references in there about song singing and so forth and, you know, to, the, to the Lord. Now we will sing to God in heaven as well you know, when we get there. The 24 elders will, will sing to God during the tribulation as Jesus will be worthy to open the sealed book. It is possible that these are the twelve sons of Jacob and the twelve apostles of Jesus, with Paul being the twelfth that replaced Judas Iscariot. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Those who have overcome the beast during the tribulation will sing in heaven to God. We see that in Revelation chapter 15 verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And the Levites that were the musicians were only given that duty so they could could make sure there was music to worship God. You know, this shows the importance of music by God and worshiping Him. You know, that was their, their sole duty was, you know, different priests had different duties, but the ones that were, they were part of the music, that's all they took care of was making sure that, that the Israelites had this God the music. You see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 33. And these are the singers, chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free. For they were employed in that work day and night. You know, so that's all they did. They just made sure that there was constant music for God. You know, and if you read in the, the book of Psalms, you know, some of the individual uh, Psalms, they'll have, you know, underneath it, there'll be a little superscription. And it'll say, like, a Psalm of David, or say something about this, mention about the singers, and so forth. You know, so sometimes, you know, they'll actually mention them, actually, in, you know, in that superscription. Now God himself sang over Jerusalem. God sings and created his creation to sing to him as well. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will say, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. You know, I mentioned in my opening prayer, but birds sing and whales sing, especially like your humpback whales. You know, the heavens sing as God sing to God as does his creation. The stars make music to him. The scientists have even heard the songs with the biggest stars having low deep sounds like tubas or double basses, and the smaller stars have higher pitches like flutes. So, you know, God's creation, it's not just man he has, but you know, his whole creation sings to him. You know, that's, you know, that's how important that music is to God. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 23 says, Sing all you heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth in the singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed God, hath, sorry, hath redeemed Jacob 
that glorified himself in Israel. And then Isaiah 49, 13. Sing, O heavens, O be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. You know, so all of nature, you know, sings to God, no matter what it is, the trees and so forth. You know, we can't hear it. You know, just like we can't see God, but we can't hear it necessarily because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But they all sing in whatever way to God. Now, angels sang as God laid the foundation of the earth during creation week. See that in Job chapter 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know, if you look at the verses before that, it talks about that they were there, you know, God said that they were there at the foundation of the earth. And we know from other places in Scripture that morning stars and the sons of God refers to angels. Now, angels sang before the shepherds at the birth of Jesus. We see that in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now God created people and his creation with the ability to sing in order to sing and worship to him. God also gave the ability to produce instruments that are also intended to be used to worship him. So again, you know, these instruments, they're used to be worship God, not for like uh, secular, satanic, rock and roll, or other types of music like that. You know, basically, you know, music, if it isn't for God, it's for Satan. It's, it's basically that simple. Now, God wants music as a part of worship to him. He even included, as I mentioned previously, a hymnal in scripture with the book of Psalms. It consists of 150 songs, individual songs, to sing unto the Lord. Now, every English-speaking Christian who is walking with the Lord should have a King James Bible, number one, which God's preserved words in English, and a great hymnal such as Living Hymns, the Baptist Hymnal, the Hymnal for Worship and Celebration, and Heartwarming Songs and Hymns. And, and, there, and there's some other good hymnals, but... There are some bad hymns out there too, so again, be wary. But you know that you should, not only should you have your King James Bible with you, but you want to have a good hymnal so that you can sing hymns. To, you know, sing them to yourself. You know, learn them so that you can sing them to the Lord. You know, they bring the memory. So when you're you're riding around in the car or whatever, you can sing some of these things. Just like you could quote quote scripture. You study scripture. You should be reading that every day. Well, you know, try to learn. You know, some of the, the great hymns, too. Some of the, you know, learn some of the songs, you know, in Scripture and so forth. Now, Ephesians 5, 9 and Colossians 3, 16, which I read you earlier, speak of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, psalms come from the book of Psalms in Scripture. They're literally the, the, the 150 psalms that you find in the King James Bible. Now, hymns are those great hymns found in a hymnal, such as some of the ones I mentioned, such as Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art, and spiritual songs are songs such as the old Negro spirituals, such as Go Tell It on a Mountain and Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. But I also believe that the spiritual songs is also sometimes, say like when uh, a Christian suddenly gets inspiration from God, just something comes to him, you know, or... You know, you're just sitting there and all of a sudden God gives you something and you start singing. You know, even like say, for example, when uh, Miriam or, or Moses, when they sang after the crossing the Red Sea, I would say those are more like your spiritual songs, that, 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 that that's what they are. You know, that, that, uh, you know that, that God gives them to you, that you'll be speaking along just like God speaks to us in other ways. I think he speaks to us through some of those, those songs. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that the hymnals too, I think God sometimes inspires people to write some of those, you know, but I think spiritual songs are a little bit different in the sense that, you know, the Holy Ghost really kind of reaches out and, and it just, you know, brings it, brings it up to you. So when, you know, suddenly you get this, seems like a song out of nowhere, I, you know, if it's a godly thing, 
Sometimes I think, I think that's basically what, what a spiritual song is. But godly music will honor the Lord and not the musician or singer as is often done with contemporary music and Christian rock. And as I said, this is, you know, the secular music, of course, they're always trying to get the glory. But you see this all oftentimes too, and those that sing the contemporary music and the so-called Christian rock and others, you know, it's all about them and the, and the, and the musician. And it's about the, whoever the singer is. You know, they're, they're always seem to get the glory rather than God. You see people carrying on in the congregation, you know, going along and dancing and doing all this stuff with them. And I don't think that that just, I just don't personally believe that that honors God. You know, they won't do some of that stuff for a hymn, but they'll get into one of these songs, which again, to me, shows that they're not from God. You know, the glory should go to God, not the singer or the musician. This is why I do not clap for singers in church. So that God gets the praise and not the singer. All singing to God should be directed to God, not ourselves. This is why there should not be no crazy movements on stage as is done by Christian rock stars who want to bring attention to themselves and not God. Praise should only be directed to God, not to the singer. You know, we see it all the time. You know, they'll be up there and a lot of times they'll have the smoke coming out, just like in secular rock, or they'll have whatever going on. And it's just, they're bringing attention to themselves. They're not bringing glory to God by that kind of stuff. So to me, it just shows again that it's not godly music. Satan, who was originally Lucifer when he was created, he was originally named was Lucifer, was created with built-in musical instruments and most likely led the heavenly choir. Now, Satan and his angels, after their fall, are never again said to sing as sin brings about no desire or joy to sing praise to God, which is what music is all about and meant for. Now we see this about Lucifer having these built-in instruments. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle. In gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. You know, Lucifer had built in tabrets and pipes in his body that were to be used to sing praises to God. Look at that last part again. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. You know, in tabrets and pipes, as I said, those were type of musical instruments. Especially in the olden days, you know, biblical days. And you notice clearly in the first that Satan is a created being. Many try to say that he is God, you know, Satan is and so forth. Satan is a created being. He is not God. And also notice all these various stones that were on these beautiful diamonds and emeralds and stuff he had gold on and so forth, sapphires. The emerald, you know, and then we see originally when God created Satan, he was a beautiful being. But due to his sin, he is no longer a beautiful being. Satan is, is an ugly, evil-looking creature of what he is. He is an evil being. He is all evil. You know, he is the, the king of evil. And you know, again, Satan has taken over with his own music. He wants music to worship him. Just like God created music to be worshipped to him. Well, Satan tries to always steal the glory from God and always tries to copy everything God does because he wanted to be God himself. Well, just like he, he did with everything else, he did the same thing in music. And that's why he has corrupted virtually all music today. You know, whether it's the rock and roll, rap, or, uh, you know, even most of your country music. And, and just, you know, most kind of music, like I said, it does not honor God today. And that includes most of the, what I'm preaching about here today, even within the churches. You know, Satan has got, gotten into the churches so that all this, most of this contemporary music and your know, Christian rock and rap and Christian rap and all this other stuff, it's all just satanic music under the guise of being, quote, Christian godly music. But it's not. It is still from the, its father, Satan. You know, it's ungodly. You know, it's no better than the, the secular satanic music that, that pleases Satan rather than God. 
Now, many great hymns have been written over the years by many godly hymn writers and musicians such as Charles Wesley, Fanny Crosby, who was blind, Alfred E. Smith, Isaac Watts, William Cowper, Philip P. Bliss, Ira D. Sankey, and many, many others. Now, there's been many great hymn writers over the years that God has blessed with giving us the great hymns and songs and so forth that we have today. Now here is the history of, of just a couple of hymns to show how the hymn writers were inspired by God to write them. The first is the unofficial Baptist hymn, you know, the great hymn, Amazing Grace. You know, that, that you know, with Baptist, we kind of jump around, but you know, that's kind of like our unofficial Baptist hymn um, National, you know, instead of like a national anthem, it's like the Baptist anthem. You know, it's what we joke around with. You know, everybody knows, most people know Amazing Grace. Now, this hymn was written by John Newton in 1779, and it essentially gives the testimony of his sinful life, but also aptly applies to all, to us all as well. You know, to every person who's ever lived. You know, we're all born as a, as a sinner, first and foremost. And need to get saved, turn to Jesus and get saved. And what he's saying, it applies to each and every one of us. You know, he once was, was, was blind, but now he sees. He once was lost, but now is found, and so forth. You know, that's the same with us. Once you turn to Jesus, you know, we're all blind, whether I'm not talking physical blindness, but we're talking spiritual blindness here. And we're all spiritually lost. Until we turn to Jesus, then our eyes will spiritually open up and our will spiritually no longer be lost, will be a child of God. Now John Newton was the captain of a slave ship who was a drunk and one who loved sin. You know, he was a, a, a drunkard. He was always drunk and just a man who loved sin. He was always living a life of sin. After he was saved, you know, by God's grace, he would later go on to write this great hymn. And as I said, he was a captain of a slave ship. So, you know, he didn't care, you know, him, I mean, he, he didn't see anything wrong with slavery. Slavery was wrong. And he was just, had all these sins in his life, but God got a hold of him. And he, you know, after he got saved, he wrote this great, great hymn. Now, another hymn, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, was written by Horatio Spafford, with the music being done by Philip P. Bliss in 1873. Now, Horatio was a Chicago lawyer who lost nearly everything he owned in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In 1873, he sent his wife and children to England so his children could get an education since most of the schools in Chicago had not been rebuilt. At the last minute, he stayed behind for a business meeting, planning to meet up with them later. His wife and ch uh, children sailed on the ship Villa de Havre. Halfway there in the middle of the ocean, the ship collided with another ship and sank. Horatio's four children, all daughters, died with, his own, with only his wife surviving. She sent him a telegram, saved alone. Some said when he saw this, he was inspired to write the words to this great hymn. Others say he wrote them after he sailed to meet up with his wife in England. And the captain notified Horatio at the point where the Villa de Havre had gone down. It is said that it was at this time that he wrote this great hymn. Either way, these two stories show how God can take tragedy and a sinful life and turn them into great hymns which honor and glorify Him. You know, on a little side note, this man, Philip Bliss, that wrote the uh, music, Philip P. Bliss, that wrote the, the music to this hymn, he himself would be later killed in a tragic train wreck. The uh, train it was going over a bridge in Pennsylvania, if I remember, it was going over a bridge, and the bridge gave gave out, and the bridge fell down, and uh, or the train fell down and through the hole, and Philip was killed. 
So, you know, you see that God can, can take tragedy and make it into something great. And may we all, in closing, may we all be inspired by these great hymns and their stories and always remember to worship God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and do not neglect singing as a part of the worship service. You know, again, there's too many people, they want to get rid of the music or they want to cut it back to, oh, let's only sing uh, hymn one, two, and four, or just one and four or something. You know, they don't even want to sing all the hymns. Sing all the verses, because many of these great hymns also have a story behind them. And when you start skipping them, then you miss part of the story or the great, some of the great scripture that goes along with it. But, you know, don't be afraid to sing unto God. But let's get rid of this ungodly music along with the ungodly Bibles. People want to get rid of the King James Bible in the churches today and put all these corrupt non-King James Bibles such as the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, uh, Bible, the ESV, English Standard Version, the Christian Standard Bible, you know, shame on the Baptist, and, and on and on and on. You know, there's so many, you know, the New King James, all of these things, you know, they're satanically controlled by Satan. You know, we need to get rid of them, go with the King James Bible, and then stick with God, godly music. Let's have, like Bible, uh, Scripture tells us, have the great hymns, the songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. And let's get rid of all this ungodly godly music so that we can worship God with music, that, that He will be pleased with us. Praise God with our singing, and may singing to God be a joy in our hearts. And with that, we're going to close with a word of prayer. Father, again, we come to you. We thank you for this time that you've allowed us here to just study your word. And Father, we do pray that if there's anyone listening today, that if they're not saved, that, that today might be the day of their salvation and they might get saved. And Father, we do pray that, that many Christians will listen to what Scripture says, what you say, Lord. Get rid of all this ungodly music out of their lives. You know, all this contemporary music and the satanic Christian, so-called Christian rock and Christian rap and all this other so-called Christian music that is nothing more than satanically controlled music. And Father, may we turn back to the great hymns of many days, you know, the days before us and the spiritual songs and, and uh, the great psalms that you've given us in Scripture, Lord. And Father, may you bless hymn writers and, and writers, songwriters today of some more great godly songs that maybe are used to honor and bless you. And Father, we ask for safety for everyone as they go home. We just ask you to bless each and every one in this church. Be with those that are listening to this, this sermon, wherever they may be, and that you honor and glorify them as well. And that just want to give you the honor and praise. And in Jesus' name, pray, amen.